Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends welcome to the class of public international law lecture number 8 on immunities i am dr ashutosh acharya senior assistant professor law center 2 faculty of law university of delhi well friends i come again here before you to discuss again a very important topic of contemporary times in contemporary times we see that international relations have grew to a larger extent. It has not restricted itself only to bilateral relations, whereas we see that multilateral relations have also grown to a significant extent. We also see that with the rise in the number of international organizations, it has become important for his states to send their representatives, to send their messengers, to send representative who can send the message, who can represent them either at intergovernmental meetings or at international organizations or at some other state. So the topic immunity becomes important as far as regulation of these representatives, of these messengers are concerned. Yes, it has become important in today's time, but we cannot ignore the past as well, where we see that a messenger, a diplomat, a counsel from one particular state reaching out to another state was supposed to be treated with dignity, with respect and was supposed to be not harmed with. This was a common reciprocal treatment which we see even in ancient texts. If you look at Ramayana, Lord Hanumana was the messenger. If we look at Mahabharata, we look at Lord Krishna to be a messenger. And all of these messengers were supposed to be treated with dignity, with respect. So, the post and position of a messenger has been significant in the texts, ancient texts, in the ancient times, in the medieval times or in the modern times. And therefore, we will discuss the legal regime that we see today in the present times as far as protection provided to these messengers are concerned, protection provided to these representatives are concerned, protection provided to the head of the state is concerned, when that head of the state, when that messenger, when that diplomat is not within its own jurisdiction but is present in some other foreign jurisdiction. What kind of protection, what level of protection will be provided will be discussed in today's class. What is the classification with respect to such protection will be discussed in today's class. If we try to understand the meaning of the word immunities in general, I would say in Hophalian terms where he compares, where he brings correlation between the concept of rights along with it applicable duties, we will see that he has placed immunity in correlation with disability. A legal system is having the competence and the ability to allow a claim to proceed against any individual wherever there is breach of obligation or wherever there is breach of duty. However, we see that that particular claim can be restricted in scenarios, especially where a particular person who is duty bound or who is having certain obligation will not be brought before the court or no charges can be levied against that particular individual, if that particular individual is immune. So immunity comes up as a safeguard to certain individuals, to certain persons in general, which disables 
the legal system to take any kind of action against that particular legal personality who is immune. So therefore, taking ahead from this, let us look at the learning objectives for the day and it will be to understand the conceptual basis of immunities from jurisdiction, to learn the development of law of immunities in international law, to learn different approaches to immunity, to learn about the law of extension of immunity in a foreign state. Now, friends, what do we mean by sovereign immunity? Because we need to understand that when a particular person is present in some other territory or in, some, in, in the jurisdiction of some other state, then he or she is either present for its own individual, personal, private matters or concerns. He or she may be a tourist in that particular state, but not necessarily. Sometimes individuals are present in some other jurisdiction or territory as they are representing the state. We are not talking here about casual representation. We are here talking about certain special specific acts which have been endowed upon them to be performed in foreign jurisdiction. And those acts would then be categorized as sovereign acts on behalf of the state in a foreign territory. And when such sovereign acts are performed, sovereign immunity may be granted to those particular individuals. Certain classifications have also been made for these different types of acts which fall within the domain of sovereign acts and accordingly sovereign immunity is also granted. Well friends, there have been a developmental phase of such immunity being granted as far as person present in a foreign territory is concerned. There are largely two approaches that we see as far as sovereign immunity or grant of sovereign immunity is concerned. The basic underlying idea is to see that whether sovereign acts have been performed or not. If the sovereign acts are performed, certainly it becomes logical that a foreign state provide immunity to that particular individual who is representing its parent state. So, we will see two approaches, an older one and then after, uh, after the older one was not fit for use as far as the uh, practice of states were concerned or you can say after we see that the older approach getting misused, it was realized that there is a necessity, there is a requirement of a little newer approach. So, these two approaches are known as absolute immunity approach and a restrictive immunity approach. Now, let us first understand what do we understand by absolute immunity approach. Friends, under absolute immunity approach, as the words themselves signify that the immunity is absolute. A foreign state will provide and give immunity to an individual irrespective of the nature of act. It will provide immunity to all the kinds of acts that are performed by the person that are recognized as sovereign acts by the state. It will not go into the actual nature of the act. It will not dive and delve into the actual nature of the act along with that whether the act is a public function or a private function. So, we see that there is an absoluteness as far as endowing of immunity over that particular individual is concerned. It will not go into the matter that whether that particular act is actually sovereign or not as far as its characteristic features are concerned. So, we see that there is complete immunity and when we talk about these two different acts, as I said, sovereign acts and non-sovereign acts, absolute immunity approach will provide you immunity irrespective of this particular differentiation. The only requirement for this would be that a state must, the sending state must categorize that particular act to be a sovereign act. So, in that particular scenario, a state may take benefit of this particular approach and categorize any act 
which is not in the nature of sovereign act also to be a sovereign act. I repeat that a state can take advantage of this particular approach and categorize even a non-sovereign act to be a sovereign act and in that scenario the receiving state is then bound to provide immunity because the sending state has categorized that particular private act also to be a sovereign act even if it is, in, it is not in the nature of a sovereign act. And for this there are two traditional Latin phrases known as jure imperi and jure gestionis. Jure impere is providing you immunity to all the governmental acts and it means by right of sovereignty. So, it is very simple to understand here that if a sovereign in a particular continent or a sovereign of a particular state sends its representative, it is by the act of sovereign. But if the sovereign has not sent it, the individual has gone its own, on its own, then it is a non-sovereign act. But what if the sovereign later on, not initially, but later on categorizes a particular act to be a sovereign act only in order to protect that particular individual? Because for all sovereign acts, a particular individual will get immunity or the person will be immune from the jurisdiction or legal system of the receiving state. So, therefore, jure gestionis is about immunity to private acts, that is by way of doing business. So, absolute immunity approach will provide immunity to both the kinds of acts, either arising by right of sovereignty or by way of doing business also, where there are private persons involved. Generally, immunity in today's time is not provided. However, states had in the past especially in 18th, 19th century, we see states providing immunity even to private individuals, even if they were not involved in the sovereign acts, taking benefit of absolute immunity approach. We will look at the different, uh, different types of approaches that have been adopted and also we will see the developmental phase. So, let us look at UK approach, which settle down a particular position with respect to absolute immunity approach. And herein we see that a very important case that was decided first in 1879 and then it went for appeal in 1880. We see that in a particular case, this particular issue was discussed. Now, this case is important as far as implementation of international law into domestic legal system is concerned as well, but at the same time it makes note of this particular kind of immunity where we talk about jure imperi and jure gestionis. Because states again I am saying that states could take advantage of this particular situation wherever there is no sovereign act being performed even then states could categorize it as a sovereign act so that that particular individual or body or a, sh or a ship in this particular case could get immunity. So, the name of the case is Parliament Belge case and here we are quoting the 1880 appellate court decision. Well, friends, in 1879 this case was decided in favour of UK. Here the background of the case is that Parliament Belge was a Belgian ship which was a male messenger used to bring mails from Belgium to England, from England to Belgium. On one fine day, Belgium declared Parliament Belge to be a warship, that means it declared it to be a state ship. However, it was a private ship performing private functions, but since it wanted to protect that particular ship from any future or further claim that could arise against the ship. As a result, we see that another again one fine day, this particular ship that is Parliament Belge collided with a tug which was belonging to England or which was registered or having a nationality of England. As a result, Parliament Belge was captured, was tried for the collision, claims were made against Parliament Belge. The argument that was laid down by Belgium was that English court will not have jurisdiction against Parliament Belge as Belgium has declared it to be immune and has declared it to be a warship. That means, since it is a sovereign property, sovereign body, that means a case cannot be levied against the ship. 
Now, let us also see that since ship is considered to be a legal personality under maritime law, under laws of admiralty, therefore, the ship can also be captured, the damages can be recovered by selling the proceeds or the ship itself. So, here we see that though court denied this particular argument in domestic legal system largely on the basis that the domestic legislation has not recognized the treaty signed between England and Belgium. Yes, England and Belgium had entered into a treaty as far as protection or immunity of such ships were concerned. However, at the same time based on non-implementation of international law and domestic legal system unless and until there is an act of parliament led to claims of the Belgium go away. Whereas, when we talk about immunity as far as this case is concerned, I would quote here the appellate court's statement and it said, declines to exercise by means of its courts any of its territorial jurisdiction over the person of any sovereign or ambassador of any other state or over the public property of any state which is destined to public use though such a sovereign ambassador or property be within its jurisdiction. So friends, we see that even if this case does not succeed but it laid down to very important jurisprudence as far as immunity is concerned and it was to see that if a state has recognized a particular private body to be immune from the jurisdiction of a foreign state, the foreign state is to completely accept that particular aspect. It will not refuse if it has agreed in international terms. Now, taking that particular aspect, a further, many further cases also took Parliament Belge case to be of significant value. They went on to apply the decision of the Parliament Belge case. We also see the same approach in Porto Alexandre case of 1920. A Portuguese requisitioned vessel against which a writ was issued in an English court for non-payment of dues for services rendered by Tux near Liverpool. The vessel was exclusively engaged in private trading operations, but the court felt itself constrained by the terms of Parliament Belge principle to dismiss the case in view of the Portuguese government interest. So, we see in this case also as the principle of Parliament Belge case was applied, it led to or it resulted into applying absolute immunity approach that even if the ship or even if the property is a private property, even if the person who is engaged in the transaction is a private person has nothing to do with the sovereign or public functions, absolute immunity approach will provide protection to these private bodies, individuals, functions as well. However, we see that American approach is little different because it saw that applying absolute immunity approach will lead to disadvantageous position as far as domestic jurisdiction or domestic legal system is concerned because states can take undue advantage of absolute immunity approach and declare any ship to be immune and as a result, the receiving state will not be in a position to even have claim against private acts of foreign belonging to a foreign state. So, it took a restrictive approach and it goes on to say that at, as, as we see the American approach, it is a little different as it first confirms the ownership. So, what it does is it bifurcates between the two types of ships. It will see that who is the owner of the ship first of all or who is the owner of a particular property or if a particular act is in question or function, functional aspect is in question, it will see that whether it is public function or private function, whether it is guaranteed and supported and backed by sovereign or it is not backed by sovereign. So, it will go into the nature of the act, it will go into the nature of the property as it first confirms ownership and then control and possession over the vessel. In case possession and control is missing on the part of the state, then immunity is not extended. So, we see that a restrictive approach is undertaken as far as United States of America is concerned. It does not blindly give sovereign immunity to any particular property just because the sending state has recognized it as a sovereign 
property or the act to be a sovereign act. Following the approach of Americans, we see in 1950, Austria also adopted a similar approach. In 1952, we see that a particular letter was issued with respect to the same aspect known as the Tate Letter by the US Department of State. In 1976, UK in Philippines admiral case rejected the approach taken in Parliament Belge case. So for a longer period of time, almost, almost 100 years or so, we see UK going by absolute immunity approach. However, we see that in 1976, it went on to change the approach to restrictive approach. And therefore, we see a major shift to restrictive approach, US Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act in 1976 which provides grounds under which a state may be subject to jurisdiction and also UK State Immunity Act 1976, which provides for exceptions to immunity. Now, when we talk about again sovereign and non-sovereign acts, segregation of acts that will benefit from immunity and that will not. So, as we have already discussed that the nature of the act has to be identified and let us also take into account another case of 1964 that is victor victory transport case. The US court in this case refused to grant immunity unless the activity in question fell within one of the categories of a strictly political or public acts. So therefore, unless and until the act in which the particular property or the person is involved is political in nature or public in nature, immunity will not be granted. And how do you identify? So, for that, it has to be either an internal administrative act, a legislative act or acts concerning the armed forces or diplomatic activity and public loans. The basic approach in international scenario has been to recognize the rule of immunity and list out exceptions so that the onus of proof falls on the other side of the line. So, a state can do in modern times, it can list out the exceptions under which immunity will be granted, will not be granted and then leave upon the other state to either fall in the exception or, or either fall in the exception or not fall in the exception. So, it has done its part, now it leaves on to the other state, the sending state, whether it can prove it to be falling within the exception or otherwise. Now, the law governing in today's time, the jurisdictional immunities is United Nations Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities of States and their property 2004. The provisions which give, provides for immunity, jurisdictional immunity are Article 5, Article 1, Article 2 and few others as well. However, the important ones have been mentioned here. So, Article 5 says, the state enjoys immunity in respect of itself and its property from the jurisdiction of the courts of another state subject to the provisions of the present convention. Here, when we say that a state enjoys immunity in respect of itself and its property from the jurisdiction of the courts of another state subject to the provisions of the present convention, we need to understand what do we mean by the word state here. because we are talking here about the representations, the property of the state. So, in all these scenarios, if immunity is given to the state, then we must expand the understanding of the word state. So, therefore, Article 1, Clause B says, state means the state and its various organs of government, constituent units of federal state or political subdivisions of the state, which are entitled to perform acts in the exercise of sovereign authority and are acting in that capacity. So, friends, when we say organs of the government, how do we identify that a particular body is the organ of the government? Largely, it is the internal law of that particular state that will help us identify that whether a particular body in question is an organ of the government or not an organ of the government. So, internal law will help. Additionally, in general, we understand that legislative acts, executive acts and judicial acts also can fall within the domain of organ of the state or organs of the government. Further, we see that agencies or instrumentalities of the state or other entities to the extent that they are entitled to perform and are actually performing 
acts in the exercise of sovereign authority of the state are also included within the domain of the word state. Representatives of the state acting in that capacity. So, apart from being organ, if a particular person is sent as a representative of the state and the capacity has been also endowed upon that particular representative, then it would also qualify to be a state. Article 2 says, in determining whether a contract or transaction is a commercial transaction under paragraph 1c, reference should be made primarily to the nature of the contract or transaction, but its purpose should also be taken into account if the parties to the contract or transaction have so agreed or if in practice or if in the practice of the state of the forum that purpose is relevant to determining the non-commercial character of the contract or transaction. Now, this comes as a protection to developing countries specially because a state can involve itself into public functions which are not commercial in nature. Largely, such functions are falling in the domain of immunity. But a state can also fall or a state can also involve itself into certain contractual relations which are commercial in nature. Now, whether such commercial acts or properties involved in commercial acts by the state are also protected through immunity, the nature of the act has to be taken into account. In such scenarios, we see that developing countries can take help from Article 2 and benefit by providing immunity to such commercial transactions. Whereas, we need to understand also the fact that when commercial transaction is taking place, a state initially may not be involved in that particular commercial transaction, but later on it may decide to provide immunity. In that particular situation, it would be misusing the approach which provides immunity to that particular developing country or any other country. So, in situations where a state later on decides to be providing immunity to a private commercial transaction or contractual relationship, a states tend to not give immunity in such acts and that is the, an outcome of restrictive immunity approach. Let us discuss a case to understand in a better manner. The incidents of Playa Larga and Marble Islands. Here, the two Cuban vessels that is Playa Larga and Marble Islands, Playa owned by the state and Marble owned by private owner. The latter was taken over by Cuban government that is the Marble Islands ship. Here, when the latter was taken over by Cuban government, it was directed to reach North Vietnam where its cargo was donated to the people of that country. The test that was applied here was that whether it was public commercial vessel or private commercial vessel. So, we need to look at the nature which is based on purpose and control. So, the test to be applied on the nature based on purpose and control led to the conclusion that Marble Islands is not a sovereign ship. It is a private ship and no immunity could be granted to it. Again, if you look at Sen Gupta versus Republic of India 1982 in England, we need to see that in this particular case or in general also, if we see that when a particular representative is sent by a particular state, let us say in this case, Sen Gupta sent by India in England, if he or she enters into a contractual relationship which is on behalf of the state, then it will be categorized as a sovereign, sovereign act. What if that particular individual who is representing the India or any other country in any other state act, enters into enters into a contractual relationship in that foreign territory for its own purpose and not on behalf of the state, rather on behalf of its own benefit or for its own self transaction. Then can we say for breach of contractual obligation that particular person will be immune. So, in this particular case it was emphasized that in deciding whether immunity applied 
one had to consider whether it was the kind of contract an individual might make, whether it involved the participation of both parties in the public functions of the state, the nature of the alleged breach and whether the investigation of the claim would involve an investigation into the public or sovereign acts of the foreign state. So friends, we need to look at again the nature of the act. So situation is very simple and clear if the representative is entering contractual relationship on its own behalf then that particular individual would be responsible and no immunity will devolve upon that particular individual. However, however, it will also depend upon the type of immunity that one that particular representing representative is carrying. But complex situations come into being when things are muddled together, when they are attached together, that contractual relationship cannot be prima facie or on the face of it identified that whether it is public in nature or private in nature, whether it is representing the sovereign act or a non-sovereign act. In such situations, we need to apply the test of nature based on purpose and object. And based on that, after identification of the nature of the transaction, that whether it is public or private, only then we can conclude that it was a so whether it was a sovereign act or it was a non-sovereign act. Now, Apart, after we look at sovereign acts or after we have the uh, jurisdictional immunities in place, either through convention or through customary practices, we need to bifurcate the two types of immunities that are provided largely to, to, to two types of representatives. We need to bifurcate two types of immunities over two types of representatives. The one category is of diplomats, the other category is that of consuls. The laws governing the diplomats is different from the laws governing consuls. There is overlapping, there is similarity as far as their protection, as far as their immunity in a foreign state is concerned. However, we will look at how it functions as far as diplomatic law. Why do we need diplomatic law? So, what is diplomatic law? A law that governs the activities of diplomats, that provides for protection and immunities to diplomats. But why do we need such a protection? We need such a protection so that we can in a reciprocal manner establish communication between two states. We can send, as I said, diplomats have been acting as a messenger, the states can send their messages, the states can register their protest. So, message may be a positive message, a message may be a negative message. So, in order to avoid any future type of intense conflict between two or more than two states, messengers play a significant role in diluting any kind of misunderstanding in sending message in a progressive manner or any other act directed by the state. So, a diplomat is nothing but a prime representative of the state in any other country. Well, friends, why diplomatic law to it is the answer is to extend communication, maintain international relations in pursuit of friendly relations, presence in foreign states for commercial and economic activities also. So, diplomats play a significant role as far as maintenance of international relations and in today's time especially they play a significant role as far as cultural, economic, political growth is concerned. Therefore, it is one of the most accepted and uncontroversial areas of international law. And we have seen that breach of the rights of diplomats, breach of the immunities provided to diplomats or to consulars have been protected under international law. And states take it as a matter of highest priority to see to the matter that diplomats and consuls are protected and immune from any local jurisdiction, from any local executive actions to be brought against them. So, when such protection is provided and if there is any breach by that particular receiving state or by any, any, rece any particular receiving state, then we can say that the concerned state has committed a wrongful act. So, breach of such immunity, breach of such protection provided to diplomats or to consuls can lead to and will lead to 
breach of international obligation and the liability international liability can be imputed upon that particular state. Let us take up the instance of United States of America versus Iran. Here if you look at the matter between US and Iran, the matter was referred before ICJ, US claimed breach of international obligations under diplomatic law by Iran against the diplomats and councils of United States of America. ICJ noted in the US diplomatic and consular staff in Tehran case, the rules of diplomatic law in short constitute a self-contained regime which on the one hand lays down the receiving state's obligations regarding the facilities, privileges and immunities to be accorded to diplomatic missions. So, we see that there are various protections that are provided under international law and this international law is largely being codified and this codified law is known as the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations 1961. Now, let me give you a background of the violation undertaken by Iran or claimed by United States of America by Iran. Those alleged violations against diplomats or consuls belonging to the United States of America posted in Iran. The background of this particular allegation is that when the revolution was happening at or in Iran, the US embassy was surrounded by certain university students as well as certain police personnel who were supposed to protect the embassy from any adverse action by these university students or other individuals or private citizens. Whereas they did not act, these individuals barged into the embassy leading to capturing of consuls working at the United States embassy, also causing destruction to the property archives of United States embassy posted in Iran. Based on such allegations, United States of America claimed against Iran that reparation be made in favor of United States of America and Iran be held responsible for the wrongful acts that it had committed against the United States of America, which are clear cut breach or violation of Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations 1961. Well friends, the treaty emphasizes upon functional necessity of diplomatic privileges and immunities to maintain international relations. Now consent here acts as the basis of diplomatic relations. This consent can be taken away only by other rules of international law such as Security Council Resolution. For example, Security Council Resolution 748 passed in 1992 wherein it imposed sanctions upon Libya wherein states were asked to reduce number and level of staff in Libya. So, in Libya wherever the other states have entered into contract that there will be mission, there will be embassy in Libya. The consent based establishment of embassy in Libya, the number of personnel being sent cannot be affected by any act of any other state, but only through security council resolution as we see in this particular example where security council resolution led to reduction of number and level of staff in Libya. Article 3 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations says representation and protection of the interests and nationals of sending a state as well as promotion of information and friendly relations. Article 14 divides the different types of representatives that can be sent in a foreign state and it says head of missions are divided into three classes namely that of ambassadors or nuncios. Nuncios is the word largely used for a representative of the Pope from the Vatican City accredited to heads of state and other heads of missions of equivalent rank. Second, that of envoys, ministers and internuncios accredited to heads of states. And thirdly, that of charges d'affaires 
accredited to ministers for foreign affairs so there is a little bit of hierarchy as far as these positions are concerned you have ambassadors then you have envoys ministers and internuncios and then you have charges de affairs now as we were talking about violations claimed by us against iran what are the specific violations that we see so we see that article 22 of the vienna convention of diplomatic on diplomatic relations was claimed to have been violated by iran wherein it seeks to protect the premises of the mission article 22 says the premises of the mission shall be inviolable the agents of the receiving state may not enter them except with the consent of the head of the mission secondly the receiving state is under a special duty to take all appropriate steps to protect the premises of the mission against any intrusion or damage and to prevent any disturbance of the peace of the mission or impairment of its dignity and as we note that in iran case icj 1980 said iran was placed under the most categorical obligations as a receiving state to take appropriate steps to ensure the protection of the united states embassy and consulates their staffs their archives their means of communication and the free movement of members of their staffs so as we have already seen the background and within that background we see that there was clear cut breach identified by international court of justice on the part of iran as far as protection provided to the us embassy personnel was concerned its property is concerned its archives are concerned their free movement is concerned apart from that we also see that in 1999 when the kosovo campaign happened when nato bombed the regions uh, surrounded by certain military or militant groups so in order to stabilize or neutralize the situation in kosovo united states planes or jets bombed those particular areas around belgrade and as a result a chinese embassy situated in belgrade was bombed and as a result us accepted its uh, wrongful act that or you can say negligent act in other words we can say so for this negligent act or wrongful act which was attributed upon us us and china entered into a settlement wherein us accepted its mistake and as a matter of claim it was awarded approximately 28 million dollars so as a matter of compensation in order to fulfill the aspects of reparation 28 millions was awarded in favor of china at the same time we see that as a response to this particular bombardment of chinese embassy in belgrade in gungzhou and in another city where us consulates were situated in china they were attacked by private citizens and as a result china also accepted its negligent wrongful act according to according to which or as per this particular uh, uh, responsibility or under this particular liability we see that china also agreed to settle the matter at around 2.8 million dollars so the protection is given to the embassy to the mission to the diplomats to the councils is inviolable in nature it is not only mentioned in the convention but convention recognizes it as a customary practice codifies it as a customary practice in westminster city council versus government of islamic republic of iran in 1986 the issue concerned the payment of expenses arising out of repairs to the damaged and abandoned iranian embassy in london in 1980 the question of defense under article 22 was raised and immunity was claimed court felt it to be procedurally unable to proceed and reference was made to substantive issue and it was noted that the premises has ceased to exist as diplomatic premises arez was not used for the purposes of the mission as required by article 22 so the embassy has to be in continuation as far as its functions as far as its usage is concerned if it is not in usage it is not that the local state or the state authorities 
cannot enter into the premises of the embassy without the permission of the embassy. Yes, that particular embassy is inviolable as far as its premises, individuals, property, etc. is concerned. But with this case, we also get to learn that it, the, the inviability or the protection gets waived off once it is not in use. Apart from that, the protection is provided to diplomatic bags. Diplomatic bags are the mails, the couriers, the bags that carry certain messages, certain products, certain documents of sovereign importance. And these diplomatic bags also have protection under Article 27 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. And it says, the receiving state shall permit and protect free communication on the part of the mission for all official purposes in communicating with the government and the other missions and consulates of the sending state. Wherever situated, the mission may employ all appropriate means, including diplomatic careers and messages in code or cipher. However, the mission may install and use a wireless transmitter only with the consent of the receiving state. The official correspondence of the mission shall be inviolable. Official correspondence means all correspondence relating to the mission and its functions. The diplomatic bag shall not be opened or detained. Whereas we also see that certain countries have taken reservation to the protection provided to diplomatic bags. Certain countries such as Libya, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia had made reservation to Article 27 Clause 3, wherein they, will, they can, they could open the bag in the presence of an official representative of diplomatic mission otherwise it will be returned. Diplomatic immunities to personnels, Article 29, 30, 31 talks about the agents, personnels sent on diplomatic missions. Here Article 29 says the person of a diplomatic agent shall be inviolable, he shall not be liable to any form of arrest or detention. The receiving state shall treat him with due respect and shall take all appropriate steps to prevent any attack on his person, freedom or dignity. Again, a recognition of customary practice. Article 30, the private residence of diplomatic agent shall enjoy the same inviolability and protection as the premises of the mission. Article 31 provides that a diplomatic agent shall enjoy immunity from the criminal jurisdiction of the receiving state. He shall also enjoy immunity from its civil and administrative jurisdiction, except where action relates to private immovable property situated within the host state. Secondly, in litigation related to succession matters in which the diplomat is involved as a private person, as an executor or an heir, and finally, with respect to unofficial professional or commercial activity engaged in by the agent. So, in certain exceptional scenarios only, a person can be called upon or diplomatic agent can be called upon. A diplomat cannot be obliged to give evidence as witness. Article 37 provides protection to family members. The members of the family of diplomatic agent forming part of his household shall, if they are not nationals of the receiving state, enjoy the privileges and immunities specified in Article 29 to 36 that we had just discussed in the previous slide. Members of the administrative and technical staff of the mission together with members of their families forming part of their respective households shall, if they are not nationals of or permanently resident, residing in the receiving state, enjoy the privileges and immunities specified in Article 29 to 35, except that the immunity from civil and administrative jurisdiction of the receiving state is specified in paragraph 1 of Article 31 shall not extend to acts performed outside the course of their duties. They shall also enjoy the privileges specified in Article 36, Para 1 in respect of articles imported at the time of first installation. These immunities can be waived off and the waiver has been mentioned under Article 32 and it says the immunity from jurisdiction of diplomatic agents and of persons enjoying immunity under Article 37 may be waived by the sending state. Waiver must always be expressed. The initiation of proceedings by diplomatic agent or by a person enjoying the immunity from jurisdiction under Article 37 shall preclude him from invoking immunity from jurisdiction in respect of any counterclaim directly connected with the principal claim. Now, apart from diplomatic immunities, there are other categories of agents that are sent as a representatives to perform different kinds of functions on behalf of the state. And these different representatives are also known as consuls. And they also carry a certain amount of privileges and immunities known as consular privileges and immunities. 
The law governing consular privileges and immunities is Vienna Convention on Consular Relations 1963. Consuls represent their state in many administrative ways, that is by issuing visas and passports, promoting commercial interests of their state, assisting nationals in distress with respect to finding lawyers, visiting prisons and contacting local authorities. However, they are unable to intervene in the judicial process or internal affairs of the receiving state or give legal advice or investigate a crime. Their political functions are few and they are accordingly not permitted the same degree of immunity from jurisdiction as diplomatic agents. Article 31 says consular premises are inviolable and may not be entered by the authorities of the receiving state without consent. Article 32 and 33 says diplomatic premises must be protected against intrusion or impairment of dignity and similar immunities exist with regard to archives and documents and exemptions from taxes. Article 35 provides freedom from communication emphasizing the inviolability of the official correspondence of the consular post and establishing that the consular bag should be neither opened not detained. So similar kind of protection can be seen here as well. However, in contrast to the situation with regard to the diplomatic bag where authorities of the receiving state have serious reason to believe that the bag contains other than official correspondence they may request the bag be opened and if this is refused the bag shall be returned to its place of origin. So we see that a little lesser or you can say a relaxed approach has been taken as far as immunity to, counts, to, a, to, a, to a bag belonging to council is concerned. Now article 36 provides for communication and contact with nationals of the sending state. Now friends before we go on to read out article 36 of Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, let us discuss a case which is known as famously known as Lagrand case which is between Germany and United States of America. Now here we see that there were two brothers residing in America in the state of Arizona known as Walter Lagrand and Carl Lagrand. They were born in Germany, largely resided in United States of America as, as and when their mother shifted to America. They never applied for US citizenship, they continued to be a German national. However, they were not aware of this particular fact and one fine day they decided to commit, they commit a serious crime which was bank robbery. As a result, while undertaking bank robbery, they resulted into committing homicide, killing the bank manager and seriously injuring uh, one another person. They were indicted for the crime of homicide and the punishment for homicide in the state of Arizona was capital punishment they were supposed to be electrocuted as per the decision of the court in the state of Arizona. Now here before immediately before their sentence could be completed or their sentence was about to be executed or they were about to be executed as per the decision of the court, they got to know that they are not US citizens, they are German citizens. And at the same time, they got to know that they have certain consular rights, that is to consult councils from the embassy, that is German embassy situated in United States of America. And therefore, they requested for the same. However, the information, however, the information that they are not German citizens was kept on hold. The information that they are German citizens and not US citizens was kept on hold. At the same time, the information, the same information was not supplied to German embassy with immediate effect. Whereas if you look at article 36, we will see that there is an obligation upon the receiving state to inform the embassy as soon as possible at the first instance. So let us read clause 1 of article 36 which says with a view to facilitating the exercise of consular functions relating to nationals of the sending state. Clause A consular officers shall be free to communicate with nationals of the sending state and to have access to them. Nationals of the sending state shall have the same freedom with respect to communication with and access to consular officers of the sending state. Clause B, if he so requests, which was done in this particular case as well, 
the competent authorities of the receiving state shall without delay inform the consular post of the sending state if within its consular district a national of that state is arrested or committed to prison or to custody pending trial or is detained in any other manner any communication addressed to the consular post by the person arrested in person custody or detention shall be forwarded by the said authorities without delay the said authorities shall inform the person concerned without delay of his rights under this sub paragraph consular officers shall have the right to visit a national of the sending state who is in prison custody or detention to converse and correspond with him and to arrange for his legal representation they shall also have the right to visit any national of the sending state who is in prison custody or detention in their district in pursuance of a judgment nevertheless consular officers shall refrain from taking action on behalf of a national who is in prison custody or detention if he expressly opposes such action so we see that there is a binding obligation upon the state party to inform the consuls of the embassy german embassy in this particular case there was a binding obligation however since it was not complied with we see that the immediate information was not sent as far as detention of two german citizens was concerned and as a result we see due to delay in all of this process the two brothers were electrocuted or you can say executed germany raised protest against this particular breach by the executive authorities or the authorities of united states of america in its one particular state of arizona and therefore this case of germany versus us before international court of justice wherein united states of america admitted its lackadaisical attitude in which the whole situation was handled and therefore it went for an apology sent to the germany wherein it also assured germany that such kind of act will not be repeated against germany since germany did not demand for any compensation or any other rep kind of reparation an apology and an assurance that it will not be repeated in future was accepted by germany article 41 and 43 also provides for protection personal inviolability of consular officers and immunity from jurisdiction then we also apart from these protections provided under vienna conventions we have certain other convention such as convention on special mission 1969 vienna convention on the representation of a state in their relations with international organizations of a universal character in 1975 immunities to of international organizations since representatives of international organizations also require certain kind of immunity because they are in some other foreign state and therefore providing immunity to those representatives of international organization is also significant and important in order to carry out international relations and functional aspects of the international organization so due to functional necessity immunity to these representatives of ios becomes important and they have almost similar kind of immunity being provided as to that of the diplomats representing a particular state convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against internationally protected persons including diplomatic agents came into force in 1977 so apart from these conventions we have certain other conventions also which provides for immunities at international scenario so with this i end this particular topic here and i thank you for your patient listening namaskar